I'm Cheryl Mitchell with Tree 11, which is a retreat and learning program located on a sheep farm here in Vermont. But it's been our amazing pleasure for the last four years to be partnering with Building Bright Futures to bring to the wider public information about the really dynamite change makers in the early childhood field in Addison County and around the state. So we're thrilled today that Keely Agin is our guest. She's with Hunger Free Vermont and she'll be talking about hunger councils and many other things. So welcome Keely, thank you so much. Thank you. Us. And I'm just thinking maybe we should start if you would talk a little bit about what what are hunger councils and why do they get started? Yeah, absolutely. So like Cheryl said, I'm Keely Agin and I'm from Hunger Free Vermont. We're located in the Burlington area, um, but we're working statewide and federally to um, address hunger and um, from our youngest learners all the way up to adults. And so I think Hunger Free Vermont a few years ago realized that though we were located in Burlington, there was hunger and different issues of hunger happening all over our state, different challenges in different counties because we're a very diverse state. So we recognize that by creating the hunger councils, we would be able to more closely partner with different regional champions of um, food insecurity and hunger all over Vermont. And it's been such an incredible way to build our partnerships, strengthen those partnerships. And for us at Hunger Free, like I said, located in Burlington, to really understand the different challenges and barriers to hunger um, in all the different regions of Vermont. So I personally staff the Rutland Hunger Council specifically. So I have a really lovely relationship with all of our friends in Rutland, but we all kind of hop on the different hunger councils and get to know what's happening regionally. So I love the Addison Hunger Council. They're very lovely and super action oriented. Great, well, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm wondering, I've known the history of, it used to be called the Campaign to End Childhood Hunger and then became Hunger Free Vermont. And there used to be a really strong focus on getting child nutrition programs into schools and childcare centers. And it seems like it's expanded so much since yeah. that time. It's really become a huge advocacy organization as well as a direct service. And in this past year with the pandemic and people's huge worries about food insecurity, do you want to talk about some of the new programs that have started and how they supplement what's already been going on? Absolutely. So I'm a child nutrition specialist at Hunger Free, and I specifically focus on food access and early care. But I get to work with our amazing child nutrition team, um, like you said, on school meal programs, early care meal programs. Um, and the pandemic has really changed the landscape there. So right now, because of waivers at the federal level, um, all children are able to access school meals for free. All children 18 and under are able to access these meals. So um, at the school level, schools can provide those meals to just their students, or they can choose to be an open site. And that means that even families with children that are not involved or enrolled in the school district or supervisory union can access those school meals. Um, and Hunger Free Vermont on our website, we have a map and we use the USDA mapping tool so that folks can see where around Vermont those meals are available. And it's a super easy, safe, convenient way for families to access these really nutritious school meals. So that's been super exciting since the pandemic, especially since Hunger Free Vermont's latest advocacy um, project has been universal school meals. So before the pandemic, we were already trying to champion this bill to pass for universal school meals. And even though the pandemic has been really hard on so many people, I think folks are really seeing the importance of universal school meals for families. Um, and then of course, that plays into families with young children, families in early care, who when the early care centers were shutting down, they were able to access these open meal sites. And those are happening in Addison County as well. The other thing- Thinking Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, during the summer, actually during the early period of the pandemic, people were driving around, they were seeing coolers at the ends of people's driveways. And so the general public that wasn't really aware of the importance of childhood nutrition, I think it really opened a lot of people's eyes. And I'm so I'm very hopeful. I hope that you're hopeful that we'll move to universal school meals or universal meals for all children. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's really opened the eyes of folks who maybe don't have kids or, you know, it, it's really made clear why this is important. Because as we know, children can't develop or learn if they feel hungry. Um, so it's, it's such an important resource for folks. So maybe we should take a step back because maybe yeah. everybody doesn't know that children can't grow and learn if they're hungry. You said that you're a nutritionist and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to this work and why, why it's so important to you. Absolutely. So I went to school for nutrition at UVM. Um, and when I got out, I actually went back to my high school and became their farm to school coordinator. So I was working in the classroom from pre-K all the way up to 12th grade, trying to teach kids about um, you know, nutrition and, and good food and why school food is so delicious and the importance of local food. And I was also the farmer's market manager here in Milton. And I realized that where my calling was, was food access in general, um, because I was seeing the reality of so many families um, and children not having access to food, a basic you know, human right. And so that is kind of what drew me to Hunger Free. I saw it firsthand. I was able to work with so many really lovely food access partners and, and being brought to Hunger Free um, was really kind of the next step for me to, to work statewide to connect families and children to food as a resource. And a lot of that work is when you're seeing firsthand children who feel hungry, or, or don't have access to culturally appropriate food for them and their family, they are not able to develop at the early care level. We know so much development happens in those first few years of life. And without food to nourish that development, they're, they're left behind in some regard. And it's a really unfortunate challenge. And in schools as well, children we know who feel hungry or during the summer months go hungry and lose access to school meals how many months of learning they lose because of hunger. Yeah. So as, as you're pushing towards universal access, whether it's in the early years or the school years, or even later, I think Hunger Free Vermont doesn't limit themselves to the children. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That you also do the adult nutrition programs and um, encourage people to sign up for SNAP and some of the other things. Can you talk about sort of your lifespan view of what people need for food and security? Absolutely. So this pandemic has really um, affected food security and hunger in Vermont. And Hunger Free Vermont, like you said, we went from the campaign to end childhood hunger. That was like our, our starting organization to expanding to um, everyone from you know children to all the way up to our older Vermonters. And so we recognize the importance of supporting food security um, and anti-hunger work in Vermont. So Three Squares Vermont, SNAP, like you said, we do a lot of work with families that have young children with WIC. So we'll do training um, for childcare providers and early childhood educators around WIC and connecting families with those programs because we recognize the importance of these programs in Vermont, especially. Um, and also our older Vermonters. So working with folks that do the Meals on Wheels, and that's been super important, we've noticed during this pandemic more than ever before. So connecting families, and even at the, the school meal level, making sure families are aware um, of what's available for them is so important. Uh, and the hunger, it's been really, difficult to watch the hunger food access calls coming into 211 during this time. It's They've spiked, I think, 500% in some months compared to last year. So recognizing the importance. Um, and then also recognizing the importance of the meal programs that are happening due to the pandemic, like Everyone Eats uh, and the Farmers to Families food boxes. Those emergency food programs are so important right now. Um, but understanding that for the longevity of how folks are affected, that the SNAP programs and the WIC programs are really what's going to help folks fill in the gaps and overcome food and hunger as a barrier. So have you, as a nutritionist, have you tracked changes for kids that are not food insecure anymore because of your programs? How do you how do you learn about what's important here? Yeah, so we obviously look at hunger as the basis. Like we want to end hunger and, and it's not always focusing on 
what the healthiest food is, but incorporating things like local food to support the local economy and making sure that farm to school and farm to early care programs um, are supported by our organization. And we do professional development when it comes to providing nutritious food for all kids in early care and also in the schools. And um, it's been really cool to work for me with the early care educators and do these professional development trainings because early care educators are so interested. I mean, they do everything, but they're so interested in always improving their program and that is food related as well. So being able to just anecdotally hear from the early care educators that we work with about how much more confident they are um, serving their meals and how much more the kids actually eat, that's the bottom line is they want high participation. So how can they follow those federal nutrition guidelines and also get the kids to eat the food? So while we do these, like we've created curriculums like Tiny Taste to actually get the kids to want to participate and eat the foods and try different flavors. So just hearing from the educators is really lovely. Could you tell us a little bit more about like what exactly, what is Tiny Taste? How does it, let's say you're yeah. working with a child care program in Rutland County or Addison County, what, what would be happening for those teachers and those kids? Absolutely. So right now, unfortunately, it's all virtual. But what we do is we meet with the providers and we have some, you know, trainings that we go through with them about childhood nutrition and the importance of getting a well balanced diet and in exactly how that works at an age appropriate early care level because a lot of the materials that are out there um, for like farm to school or nutrition classes they're all school age level which is lovely but there there definitely leaves a gap for those early care years. Um, and so we'll go in and for the tiny taste curriculum, it was a curriculum that was created by a dietitian and a couple of moms who wanted to like get their children to try more food because we all know how hard it is to get young children to try new foods. Um, and so they created a bunch of really basic recipes that followed um, federal guidelines for early care food programs and got children to try all of these new recipes and they actually documented the children in their care how they responded to the recipes what they liked what they didn't like and they put it all together into a curriculum that kind of talks child care providers through how to introduce different flavors different nutritious foods how to work with farmers more and provide more local food um, and so we kind of go in and we walk them through what that process would look like, what the best practices are for that, um, and how to kind of make it easier on them and more fun for the kids. Oh, it's just, it's very exciting. We're, we're farmers, obviously, Tree Levin is located on a farm. And so the, the ways that you've all been able to build connections between local food and the schools and the early childhood programs is wonderful. And, thinking about the olden days when you used to get the commodity <laughs> food that came from goodness knows where. And I don't know if that program is still in existence. I'm curious about how the um, big food banks are kept or the big food shelves, how they're stocked. Are you part of that process as well? We've worked really closely with the food bank always, but especially during the pandemic. And in Vermont, it's the local food movement is so strong. I mean, it's still taking off, but it's there's so much love for our farmers and, and desire to serve as much local food as possible. Um, so at the food banks, it's that balance. There's a constant um, attempt to partner with farmers um, to create kind of just like a symbiotic relationship where it's like reciprocal, where, where they're providing help for farmers, maybe through gleaning, um, and then they're able to promote the farmers um, at the food bank level. Mm -hmm. And at the schools and the school food service program, there is still a huge commodities push and they're working with federal programs that really want them to get the most bang for their buck. So oftentimes that commodity food might be considered the most bang for your buck, but there are ways in Vermont that we can actually work with farmers to prove that benefits of serving local foods. Um, so a school just has to kind of put in a little extra effort, totally worth it for the kids to be able to show kids where the food's coming from and support our local farmers. Um, and at Hunger Free, that's kind of where we provide the support. Great. Could you explain to people who might not know what gleaning is, what gleaning is? 
Yeah, absolutely. So Gleaning is an amazing program where um, folks from different organizations, schools, anyone can go to a farm kind of after a season and and go through the product that's still there and collect it. And it usually gets repurposed for something, like I said earlier, to go toward a food bank um, or the school food service program. A lot of schools are working with gleaning to get their local food in. Um, and it's a really wonderful way to be environmentally friendly, um, support the farmer and support local food organizations. Great. And it seems like there's a development of processing places so that food that's been gleaned can be turned into something that's going to be easier for child care programs or school lunch programs to use. Is that a statewide movement or is that just around here? I think it's Addison's very good at it. There is uh, that's a goal that we're trying to get to be a little bit more statewide because um, we solved the first problem of like, oh, we can access this local food, but then it's like the in-between steps of being able to actually use it and get, you know, childcare facilities and families to be able to use that raw product. So Addison is actually a really kind of shining example of how that can work. And I think a lot of the hunger councils, this is why it's so cool to have these different councils, is that we can look to councils and, and communities that are doing the good work and then use those best practices to make sure that it's happening more widely. So maybe we should talk more about those councils because it seems to me maybe the work that was going on in Rutland is where the idea of the, the food is medicine, the pharmacy programs first grew and now it's taking hold in Addison County. They're relatively recent, like seven or 10 years old. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the hunger councils, you're exactly right. I don't remember the exact year, but I think it's about seven. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you staff the ones in Addison and Rutland? How, how, I know that it's, they have co-leaders co who are usually community leaders, not necessarily food people, mm -hmm. um, but Hunger Free gives them so much support to make things work. Maybe you could talk about how they work. Totally. I think the structure for the hunger councils is what makes them so successful. So we have a staff member at Hunger Free who's one of her main jobs with us, job roles, is the hunger councils. So she kind of attends every single council. She's the one who helps to organize them. And then each um, hunger council staff member has a role at a hunger council in Vermont. So we always have two Hunger Free Vermont folks attending the calls, um, but then we look to the community to elect who they think should co-chair these hunger councils. So usually you'll have two co-chairs um, and they'll be members of the community who are maybe affiliated with some kind of organization, like you said, not necessarily hunger related, but where their interest lies in solving issues of hunger in that community. Um, and you can actually, anyone can sign up to be a Hunger Council member. I'm going to put that really big plug in right now. If you visit our website or contact um, anyone at Hunger Free, we can get you affiliated with whatever Hunger Council um, you have in your region. And you don't have to attend a bunch of meetings. Usually pre-pandemic meetings were kind of like a couple times a year. Um, but each Hunger Council decides how much they need to meet, how often they need to meet. Um, and usually you're part of a list serv, so you can, your participation in the council can be totally whatever is convenient for you. Um, and you'll always receive the notes as to what's going on in your community, um, as well as being invited to Zoom calls right now, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, not in person, but where you can learn about what's happening hunger-wise in the community and what your um, colleagues are doing to overcome these challenges. And also, like I said, we learn what's going on intercouncil wise um, and work together across county lines to overcome these challenges. I, I certainly know that the one in Addison County has been wonderful. It was great before the pandemic because people got to be together in person and talk about what was going on, but also to um, indicate where the growing needs were. Yeah. And it seems as if that's continued, that it's a wonderful place to get information, say, you know, this week the schools are closed, but families were able to access school meals anyway with the, and so yeah, 
we will show all your contact information at the end of, of this show, Keely. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm wondering also if you could talk about, it was probably 10 years ago that pediatricians started asking families about food insecurity because of the clear link between that and child development and whether that's made a difference for you to have the healthcare community involved. I think it's made such a huge difference. I mean, Hunger Free Vermont, we see the value in all of our partners um, because the more partners that you have as an organization, the more folks that you're going to reach. And partnering with healthcare has made a huge difference in the families that we're reaching. And also families all have different sources of trust, um, you know, where they've built that trust. And so folks might not feel comfortable talking about their challenges that they're facing when, with hunger, maybe with a child care educator, but they might feel comfortable talking with their doctor, their health care provider about that. So the fact that we have some um, connection with health care has made such a difference in being able to connect families with programs like Three Squares and SNAP um, and WIC. And right now what we're doing is we're actually working on a health care screening project with um, folks here in Vermont. And so hopefully that'll mean that the screening questions are going to really gather the information that we need to connect families with the proper resources. So that's ongoing, but it's it's already made such a huge difference. Right. I have a million more things I'd love to talk <laughs> about with you, with you know community, school, gardens, and so on. But I've just gotten a note from Darla that we're almost out of time. So I'm wondering, are there things that you especially would like to emphasize that I haven't asked yet? Um, I would still, I would totally like to emphasize the school meal programs and for families to really listen to their schools and anything that schools are sending home. Um, pandemic EBT is coming back. And so make sure if schools are sending you any information in the mail that you are opening it up and reading it so that you can be prepared to take the necessary steps um, to hopefully get that benefit if you are eligible. Um, definitely join your hunger council. That's where we can make change. That's where we can see change. And I would probably say, yeah, just understanding how we can share out, share through your networks, where food's available right now. So many folks are really struggling with food um, and housing because of the pandemic. And if families don't have to worry about where to get their food, they can focus on other things. That would be wonderful. Well, Keely, thank you so much for being our guest today. In just a moment, um, the screen is going to show your contact information and your website, and we really encourage everybody who's out there to get in touch, get involved. As Keely said, it's not going to take, doesn't have to take all of your time, but you'll be really up to date. And we also want to give a shout out to Building Bright Futures for the work of Darla Senecal, who produces these shows, and also Middlebury Community Television, who has put them up on the website so that we can really reach a much broader audience. So thank you very much, Healy. Have a great thank day. Thank you all.